Hello everybody, this is Eric Pistelli from Antico.com and in this video I'm going to show you how to reverse engineer a PDF malware using Cerbero, the tool which I've worked on for many years. So I wrote about this specific sample some years ago so you can follow the whole reverse engineering process of this sample on the company blog. So let's open the malware with the program. Well, we don't know yet that it's malware, we actually know, but let's pretend we don't. So this is a sample. We, let's open the sample. And once we have opened the sample, we can see Cerbero already reports many issues it found. And before going all, you know, into all these issues and going into the JavaScript and so on, I want to explain you briefly how a PDF is structured. A PDF is basically just a collection of objects which are reported here in the format. Objects are numbered, they have a major number and a revision number. And in this case, they are, unre they are unreferenced because uh, this specific sample is, well, it's malware. And most malware is incorrectly formed. But that doesn't matter because PDF Reader makes sure, I mean, Adobe Reader makes sure that every malware is correctly passed and uh, displayed to the user. So that's actually a great service Adobe does for uh, its users. So um, these objects are all unreferenced, as I mentioned, and every object in a PDF can reference another object. So uh, we can start by looking into the interactive form. An interactive form is reported. Basically, an interactive form in a PDF shouldn't be considered malicious itself, but it has been abused for so long that Cerberus reports it as an issue. So uh, we can see where if you go into the dictionary of the object, oh, I forgot to mention every object is basically um, can consist of a dictionary and a stream. Um, both are optional. It can contain only a dictionary or only a stream or both. It can even contain just a value. Just to uh, show you what I mean, this is, for instance, an object which has both a dictionary, this orange part, and this blue part is the stream. Uh, the stream starts with a stream keyword and ends, uh, if we go to the end of it, it ends with the end stream keyword followed by end object. This is all optional. Uh, it is not optional by specification, but in real world, it is optional. In this case, we can see that uh, the length of the stream is specified as zero, and this is a trick um, meant for, to fool passes, basically, like uh, server. And the stream, I mean, after the stream keyword, we can see there is another end stream keyword. This is also meant to fool passes. In this case, it doesn't, it didn't work. So server correctly parses the whole raw, raw data, but this is it. So the Let's go back to the interactive form. And as I mentioned before, every object in a PDF can reference another object. And in this case, the acro form is contained in object 21.0. So if we go to 21.0, we can see the actual XML data is in object 8.0, which is the object we have just inspected before. <coughs> we can look at the, um, the raw data here. Oh, basic, by the way, the, the, the stream um, data can be compressed, it can be encrypted. This is material for another video I can show you later on, but um, in this video, in this video, it doesn't apply because this uh, PDF doesn't have this, at least this data, this data is not compressed. So let's go on and we can go directly to the XTP data, which is this one. It is extracted automatically by Cerbero. In this case, we also have some JavaScript. XTP data, it's mentioned in the beginning of the blog post, but it contains basically, um, it can contain another PDF, it can contain uh, interactive form, it can contain JavaScript, and it can be nested. So basically a PDF can contain XTP data, which can contain another PDF, another XTP data. Uh, it's just wonderful. So uh, let's look directly at the JavaScript code. And what we can see is some obfuscated code. We can beautify it a bit, Control R. Let's beautify it. Looks already a bit better. And what it does, it does some string operations. In the end, it calls evil on the variable s. And um, we can even see it that 
this string contains the word evil here. Can you see it? Yeah. But we know we know that already. So what we can do is let's open another analysis window, just not to lose our beautification of the code. Then let's go back to the XML. Oh, by the way, here, this is important. It does some operations on a value taken from the XML. So we take the same value and then we let it parse it. And instead of evil it, we just print out the final value. But we first need to take this value from uh, the XML itself, which is this value. So what we do, and we can remove this, that's not important. And we let it compute it on it. Oh, sorry, forgot the variable. Yeah, much better. Let's remove the XML tag. And now at this point, we could debug the code, the JavaScript code, I mean, but in this case, it's not needed because we just need the final expression. So we just execute it directly. So here we have some more JavaScript code. Let's select it, create a new window, sorry, a new text view. Let's tell it that it's JavaScript. So we have some syntax highlighting and we also beautify it. Ah, much better. So um, in the article, I actually um, I actually try to execute the whole code. I debug it to see what it does and what kind of final shell code it computes. But it isn't, in this case, it doesn't matter. We already know, I, I mean, I already know that this is the final shell code and it, there's, no, there's no point wasting time. So what we do is just control R, hex string two bytes, and we have already the shell code. If you have any experience reversing this kind of malicious documents and shellcode, you know that in the end it will try to download a file and execute it. So we have already the link for the file, but let's pretend this is not the case. And we actually, I'll, I mean, I'm going to actually show you how to reverse engineer it. Um, the shellcode starts after this AAA. And this is also kind of funny because we have that. This is very common, even in CTFs, always use AAA funny. So um, we just dump this to file, copy into new file, shell code, and we open a new instance of it. Okay, it already it even tells us that it found shell code. Yeah, that's good. But uh, what's actually important to know that um, Windows Defender actually detects this as malicious. Once you dump the shell code on disk, it will delete it. So I had to um, disable Windows Defender. So at this point in the article, uh, now I'm not doing this because it wasn't present yet, but now we have it, the Carbon Interactive Disassembler. So what I'm going to do is create a new uh, database by pressing Ctrl Alt C and it's x86 code. The base address can be zero, of course. So now we can inspect the code just press C and it starts <clears throat> the disassembly. We follow the jumps in the beginning. The call brings us to location A, but this is wrong because we have an instruction clashing with this address. So what we do is we undefine this instruction with U and we start again the disassembly at A. And now we have the correct code. There's still one part which is not, which hasn't been disassembled. And now it's done. Now we have the full code. <clears throat> to analyze the code, what we do is we, I mean, you could go on and do it all in the disassembly, but this is kind of annoying because it's easier to do it in a debugger. So what we do is we launch a debugger we have an action, quite useful one, which is called shellcode to executable. It just converts the shellcode to an executable and it even um, allows you to specify as a parameter a debugger to debug it. And this is exactly what we're going to do. And I'm also opening another instance of some because I already analyzed the shellcode, but I mean, I just copied the comments I had in the article into uh, database of carbon. 
and here we have the fully commented analysis already but let's first open it in the debugger so oh uh, important make always sure that you are running in a safe environment in a vm because if you screw it up you will run the shell code and download the malware which will be executed and so but i mean I'm, I'm guessing you are running it in a, in a VM, of course. So make a snapshot because even recreating a VM is annoying. We press another time run. So now we are at the entry point of our shellcode. So once you have a bit of experience reversing shellcodes, what they do in the beginning is just to resolve APIs which they need afterwards. So this first part of the shellcode, what it does is just try and resolve this list of APIs. There's a loop, this one, and it just resolves, this, this call resolves the API, and it goes on until it resolves these five APIs. So we can follow this also here. I mean, make sure when you reverse engineer a shellcode always to F7 I mean, to step in, never step over, because if you step over, you might execute the whole thing and then you have to revert the snapshot and so on. So always F7, even if in the beginning it's a bit annoying because this whole F7 uh, is going to do a lot of loops because first the shellcode has to find its own address in memory and uh, then it has to find the various APIs and so on. So but after you identify the function which resolves the APIs, you can step over it. This is exactly what I'm going to do now. Now I put a breakpoint here and I'm just running, I mean, continuing the execution until it hits that breakpoint. So I'm going on. Yeah, I fell into another, actually, I think I fall, I have fallen in the resolving function. So let's skip here. Yeah, exactly. This was, this is actually the, the, the function which resolves the API and this is the loop. I didn't see it when I entered the call and if I now I can just F8 step over it and I see which APIs ah I forgot the breakpoint let's remove that let's step until the end of it and now I can just go on and it will resolve one API at a time once it has finished that it will actually start executing the real part of the shellcode. What it does, I mean, I'm not going to do it all because it's just very boring. It pushes on the stack the string umon, it resolves the your download to file API. This is very common API used in malware because it's so easy to use compared to other methods to download files. And after it has downloaded the file, it will try to execute it with winexec first as an executable directly and then using recserve 32 minus s as a dll one of the two will work here we have again the url which i mentioned before which is the location of the malware and if this wasn't an old malware we can actually go, go on and try to download it and analyze it but this is not of course the topic of this video and to download it, there's also a very um, useful action you could use, which is Ctrl R, um, and then your download, this one. It is used, um, it goes over Tor, or let's say another proxy you have, it doesn't matter, but um, what you need is just to download the Tor browser and make sure you configure the right port and then specify the URL you want to download. And before downloading, it will actually try to confirm, um, let, 
let's say, try to verify your anonymization specified here. It will tell you your actual IP and the anonymized IP. And if you see that they are different, then you press OK, then you're safe, it will download over Tor. In this case, it's anyway useless because this malware is old, the URL will not work anyway. So this is all. If you like the video, let me know. I will be doing some more, not just related to my own stuff. And well, let me know. Cheers.